creation sings his praise for by his word all things were made he holds the keys to life and death sustains us by his very breath stars and galaxies were made for the glory of his name and hand declare his ways O Christ the matchless King be praised Jesus is the Lord of all Jesus is the Lord of all You're the one we bow before Jesus is the Lord of all stand in unity every voice will sing to him a great victorious king of kings the 
Through all life's sorrows and despair, I will not be moved. When facing death, I need not fear. I have this hope secure. Because Christ died at Calvary, sin has on me no claim. Because he overcame the grave, with him I will be raised. One for me by him's eternal. 
to that ancient hill for towering waves of guilt and gold but there your steadfast mercy still is certain as your Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you this morning. It's a good job I didn't say good evening because that's what I'm used to. It is the morning time. It's half nine. Uh, thank you for coming to the second part of Rico's seminar on faithful leadership. We're going to be looking at Mark's gospel. And um, if you've managed to print off or got on your phones um, the handout for this morning, and we'll go, I'm going to read through from Mark 8, 27 to 38, and a couple more readings after that. <clears throat> okay, we'll just start firstly by committing this morning to prayer. Lord God, we thank you this morning we can come together freely to meet and to study your word. We thank you for Rico and the gifts you've given him for evangeliz evangelism and mission. And we pray this morning that your Holy Spirit will work through we Rico and your work in our own hearts. Your challenge us and change us to become more Christ-like, to stop thinking about ourselves as much and start thinking about you more. And Lord, you will use us within your mission. We pray these things now in your precious son's name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to read Mark 8, 27 to 30. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he said? Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach to them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, but then Jesus turned and looked at his disciples. He rebuked Peter, get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have the mind, in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and the words in this adulterous and sinful generation, 
The Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. The second reading is Mark 9, verses 30 to 37. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum and he was in the house. He asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. And now we're going to read Mark 10, verses 32 to 45. They were on their way up to Jerusalem, with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to them, to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed by the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and hand him over to, to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he said. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those to whom they have been prepared. When the 10 heard this, they became indignant with J James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, Lord, lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I first uh, started using Mark's Gospel as an evangelistic text. So do you remember uh, 2 Corinthians 4, if you were here on Monday night, on Monday morning, we looked at, we preach Christ, God opens blind eyes. And in Mark's Gospel, we're shown how we preach Christ. And so that's how I first used uh, Mark's Gospel. But as I spent time in Mark's Gospel, I came to discover that it's not just an evangelistic text. Brothers and sisters, it's a discipleship manual. And we're normally taught by teaching the negative. So we see how hopeless the disciples are and how blind they are, and that teaches us what we should be doing. That's how Marx works. The other thing is, just for your notes, just do remember, Mark's Gospel is written in Nero's persecutions. His main source is Peter, who is about to uh, be crucified upside down. So really, as you come to Mark's Gospel, you've got to know it's going to be worth it. And in fact, it's so short and quick in a way because they've got to get so much in place before people are thrown to the lions. In some way, you could say, if you went to a library, uh, John and Matthew would be in theology, Luke would be in history, and Mark would be in the racy novel. It's just so immediate. You know, bang, 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 through it goes. The other issue with Mark in terms of learning faithful leadership 
is that let's remember what happened with Mark. Anyone know what happened in Acts 15 with Mark? What did he do? What happened in Acts 15? Do you remember um, he deserted Paul in Pamphylia? So he leaves uh, Paul and, 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 and separates, and then Paul and Barnabas fall out about that. But actually, he's a deserter. But in 2 Timothy 4, Paul writes, bring Mark to me, he's so useful. So he goes from being a deserter to a servant. And again, our Uncle John, John Stott, preached at All Souls, four words that, that define the four Gospels. Here they are, they're fascinating to look at. So Uncle John said, word number one is John's Gospel, and that is how high the Word made flesh, that's John, just the, the, the awesome nature of Jesus, how high. Matthew is how deep Old Testament prophecy fulfilled written for the, the Jewish reader. This is your Messiah. Look back. Can't you see the prophecy fulfilled? Luke, how wide. So the outsider comes in. Luke is a Gentile doctor, and the outsider comes in. So in Luke, the women, the, 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 the three kings, the centurion, the outside. This is for you. But Mark's gospel, brothers and sisters, is how low. It's Jesus the servant. Even the Son of Man did not come to be, to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So I want to say, as we look now, let's look at Mark as a discipleship manual, not just as an evangelistic tract where we let the gospel tell the gospel. And to that end, let me show you the, the first theme of Mark when I'm teaching it. Can you do page one of your uh, scripts there? And can you see the two-faced lady? And just make sure you can see, please, both faces. You've just got, just turn to the person next to you and make sure you can see the young woman and the old woman. This is a great little tool for teaching Mark. So just make sure you can see them both, the young woman and the old woman. Everyone got it? Now, that, now uh, just to say, if you can't, you're blind. By the way, this picture was done by an American artist in 1915, and rather bravely, he entitled it, My Wife and My Mother-in-Law. So that was quite something, wasn't it? But, uh, but here we are. I'm sure you can see both. Uh, the young girl who slightly turned away, and the woman, the old, the old lady with the dear wart on her nose or whatever it is. But there they are. Now, just if you could write over the top of Mark's Gospel, if you've got your Bible there, write it in, or write it into the person's Bible next to you. That'll annoy them, but they'll never forget it. The key word in Mark's Gospel is blindness. Blindness. The disciples are blind. And the opening page, as we come to Mark 1, verse 1, the beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So can we see... Jesus Christ, Mark 1, verse 1, is not just a man. Who else is he? Do you see? He's the Son of God. So the guessing games about God have stopped. This is who Jesus is. Now, just when I look at this, I sometimes just look at this verse evangelistically with people, and here are the four questions I ask as I say, can I just show you one verse? Maybe I'm meeting up with them and I've got a minute, two minutes. Here are the four questions. The first question I ask is this, what's your view of religion? What's your view of religion? And I get them to chat a bit. Explore, explain, encourage. Listen, listen, listen. Explore, explain. What's the next thing to say? Encourage from your own life. How do you get that? So the first, and they talk about you know, the wars and the damage religion's done. And, I, and I, I, I then say, do you know what the word gospel means? And then they might say good news. I say it means the great proclamation, the evangelion of the gospel went out. So then I say this. Do jot this down. I say... So Mark is saying, if this isn't the best news you've ever heard in your life, you've misunderstood it. That's, how I, that's my second thing, when I ask them what the word gospel means. He's saying, if this isn't the best news you've ever heard in your life, you've misunderstood it. Third question, who is the gospel about? Can we have a look down? Jesus Christ. So then I say, if your experience of Jesus isn't the best news you've ever had in your life, You've totally misunderstood the Christian faith. So with that, I try and sweep away all their previous experience and say, let's just look at Jesus. You know, Swinburne said, I would love Christ if it wasn't for his leprous bride, the church. And we at this point say, look, I know there are many problems in the church. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if you've been hurt. 
My dad was hurt by hypocritical Christians. When I was going into the church, my dad said to me, he said, Rico, I don't know why you're getting involved with these people. They're such hypocrites. He'd been on business trips with men who'd gone from the brothel to, 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 from the brothel to church, to mass. He said, why are you getting involved with them? And I had to keep saying to that over 20 years, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. And actually, Keswick was amazing. I remember him coming up here and hearing the Bible taught. It was so wonderful for him. So, number one, what's your experience of religion? Number two, what does the word gospel mean? The best news you've ever heard in your life. Number three, what's the gospel about? Jesus, we preach Christ. God opens blind eyes. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 5, we preach Christ. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, we, God opens blind eyes. And then, who is Jesus? That's the fourth question. Do you see he's the son of God? So then I just say this, do jot it down. The guessing games about God have stopped. The guessing games about God, we, God has revealed himself to us. We don't have to look for God, he's revealed himself. And then, even with a non-Christian, I model what prayer is. God speaks to us in the Bible, and we speak back to him in prayer. And I then say, let me say a little prayer. Oh, Father God, help us both to know how this is the best news we can ever hear in our life, and it's about Jesus. Amen. And that'll often be the first time I look at the Bible with someone, just three minutes just look at that and say, do you want to have another look at it? That's what, what I'll do. I've, I've done this sometimes, leaving, leaning over the tube at Oxford Circus with someone, just as they head off. I say, can I just have a little look? So you cross a bit of a pain line to get it open, then just see where they are. So here we've got it, and here's the, here's the two faces of Jesus. He's not just a man, he's God. And here's the next word to write down. The drama in Mark's gospel is that in just about every verse of Mark's gospel, the disciples or someone else is blind. So whatever passage you look at in Mark's gospel, someone's going to be blind, and they're going to be blind. Could we please turn to the inside page here to one of three issues? They're going to be blind to either the identity of Jesus, that is who he is, or the mission of Jesus, that is why he came, or the call of Jesus, that is what it means to follow him. Now, these are huge issues for evangelism. The questions I'm longing for people to ask me when it comes to evangelism is, who is Jesus? Why did he come? What does it mean to follow him? But brothers and sisters, they're huge issues for leadership as well. Let's just look at them together now. So, so I'll say, I say to people, right, let me tell you what Mark's gospel is about in 10 seconds. Here we are, 10 seconds Mark's about. It's about the identity, the mission, and the call of Jesus. So there we are. That's Mark's gospel. The lift test, you can do that. It's so simple. There's this wonderful clarity in Mark. And the disciples, of course, are blind to these three. And so the question is, what about you? Can you see? They're blind. The people in, the pass in, the, in, in Mark's gospel are blind. In fact, the only person who can see who Jesus is in Mark's gospel, ironically, Mark 10, is blind Bartimaeus. The blind man can see who he is. Son of David, have mercy on me. It's hysterical. I just love it. Well, Peter gets it as well in the end, but, but not brilliantly. Great. Let's have a look at it together now, and we'll see what this means for leadership. So in Mark 8, 27 to 30, you've got it there. I wonder if you can see who is blind and who can see over identity. And then in Mark 8, 31 to 33, I wonder if you can see for me who is blind and who can see over mission, over the mission of Jesus. Where is their blindness and sight? And then our theme today, over the call of Jesus, Mark 8, 34 to 38, who is blind and who can see? Right, over to you, uh, here or back at home. Can you dig out those three answers? So someone's going to be blind and someone can see in 27 to 30. Someone's blind and someone can see in 31 to 33 around the cross. And then when it comes to what it means to follow him, in verse 34 particularly, there's something you've got to have your eyes open to. So someone's blind and someone can see. Great. Over to you in pairs. Have a look at that, please. Who's blind, who can see in, in, in those three sections? Got a couple of minutes. Just dig that out, please. Where is their blindness and sight to those three?
One more minute, one more minute, everyone. Who's blind, who can see? Identity, mission, and call. So in 27 to 30, here is Jesus. Who's, who are the blind people in 27 to 30? Who's blind? Who can't see? Well, the disciples, but it's just more than that. It's, it's on the way that Jesus says, who do people say I am? Remember, this is Caesarea Philippi. So it's a, it's a, it's a center of religions. So he's standing there and the Buddhist and the Hindu temples are behind him. It's all the different religions, which is why they called it after Caesar to say that Caesar is Lord. That's the public truth. You can have your private religion, but you can't have public truth. And Jesus said, this is a public truth, and that's why they wanted them dead. And so here they are, and he's got Caesarea Philippi behind, behind him, and he says, who do people say I am? And they say, some say. So it's the some who say. He's John the Baptist. Uh, he's Elijah. He's one of the prophets. So if, as you look at Jesus, you think he's a great man, you think he's a prophet, you think he's a great teacher or a figure of history, what are you? You're blind. I go to Speaker's Corner in London. The Muslims are there. With great respect, they speak of Jesus, very respectfully. But as they say, look, he was a great teacher. He was a prophet. What do I know about them? They're blind. And then as we preach Christ, we pray God opens blind eyes. Who's the one who at last can see in this passage? Uh, what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you're the Messiah. Now, let's remember, the first question here, who do people say I am, is general information. What did Britain vote a couple of years ago in the election? General information. Who do people say I am? John the Baptist, whatever. The second question is personal. Who do you say I am? What did you vote? Tells me something about you. And Peter says, you're the Christ. At last, after eight chapters of information, at last, Peter has seen the real face of Jesus. He's seen it. You're the Christ. He's got it. Uh, secondly, as we look down, so, so that's the, the first issue. When it comes to identity, is he a great man or is he God? And Peter's seen you're the Christ. Now on mission, who's blind and who can see when it comes to the death of Jesus? Who's the blind person here? Peter, that's right, he's done his GCSE, he's got who is Jesus, but he's failed his A-level. Why did he come? So who's the one who can see here in verse 31? Jesus. He then spoke, he, he taught them, the Son of Man must, the word must is it's necessary that. Jesus says, I must die. And the believer, of course, goes, yes, Jesus, you must die. You must go to Jerusalem to die, otherwise I'll have to pay for my sin myself. So again, when it comes to the cross, what do we see? Peter, he just sees a waste. Do you see what he says? It's just remarkable, the, the way he's so blind. Jesus says, I've got to go to Jerusalem and die. He spoke plainly about this. Peter took him aside, began to rebuke him. Peter, because Peter's going, no, 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 I know who you are. You're the son of God. We're going to go to Jerusalem. You move into number 10 Downing Street, and I'll be in number 11. We're going to rule. We're going to throw out the Romans. You can't die. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Now, this is a rebuke, and it is about blindness. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You don't have in mind the concerns of God. If your eyes were open, you would. But merely human concerns, you're blind. So that's the next question. What do we see when we see the cross? Do we see a waste or do we see a rescue? And as we ask people to do that, we, we you know, say, what, if, what can you see? Uh, I don't know if you know uh, uh, Billy Connolly. 
He's an old man now. This was uh, 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 his biography written by his wife, Pamela Stevenson. When he's a young boy, has a brutal youth in Glasgow, but he goes to his first primary school, and this is what we're told. When he moved up to the boys' school at six years old, there was a harshness he'd not experienced in kindergarten. In the main hallway, there was a massive crucifix, a bleeding life-size Christ that thoroughly spooked him. Billy had not yet been fully indoctrinated into the faith, but once he was at the boys' school, that occurred as swiftly and as subtly as a fishhook in the nostril. On his first day at his new school, his teacher, Miss Wilson, informed him that Jesus was dead and that he, Billy, was personally responsible. So Billy, as a six-year-old, looks at the cross and he can't understand what's going on and he's told it's your fault, he died for your sin. But he's totally blind, he cannot see it. And, uh, and years later, at the uh, Royal Albert Hall, this is, um, uh, this is um, what he shouts out as he finishes his show. At the end of the Billy and Albert show, Billy farewelled 6,000 aching people with, it's been a pleasure talking to you, don't worry, I'm the one going to hell. Total blindness to the cross, isn't it? So as a six-year-old, he doesn't get it, and then he mocks it later on. But if you understand the cross, you're going, oh no, Billy, no, he's saving us from hell there. But that's blindness. So number one, identity. Secondly, mission. Now, as a leader, why is it so important to get identity and mission in place when we're talking about leaders? Well, let's just have a look at Mark chapter 4. Flick back. So if you're going to be a faithful leader, we've got to get identity. We've got to know that he is God. We've got to know he's the Christ, the ruler. And we've got to know, brothers and sisters, jot this down, he is sovereign. Because if we're not, if we're not embracing the sovereignty of God as leaders, then in terms of our own and the pastoral care of others, it'll be a disaster. Let's have a look and see that. Mark 4, 35 to 41. So this is the identity of Jesus. What do we learn about the sovereignty of God here? By the way, this was the passage, wasn't it, that the Pope spoke on on the first week of the COVID lockdown. It's where so many went, so many Christian leaders. Verse 35, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat, Mark 4, 36. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall, lilacs came up, and, the, and that's the word for it, a sort of hurricane, broke and waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Now, if that's all he is, a teacher, they're going to die. What can your teacher do at this point? I mean, I had a geography teacher at school, Mr. Howard. He could have said, oh, Rico, what's happening is the cold air from the mountains is meeting the warm air from the sea, and that's why you're going to die. Nice information, but it won't save me. He better be more than a teacher. Verse 39, he got up, rebuked the waves, and said to the wind, be quiet, be still. Then the wind died down. It was completely calm. Of course, I can't even do that with my bath water. But Jesus flattens a storm because he is, Mark 1, verse 1, the Son of God. He flattens a storm. His disciples uh, said, to, uh, he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? You said, have no faith. They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So who is he? Well, he's the Lord and God. But what does this mean? A couple of things pastorally in terms of leadership. Number one, it is Jesus that leads them into the storm. He says, let's go over to the other side of the lake. If you are in a storm, Jesus has led you in there. He's in control. And secondly, he is not asleep. So often we can feel, I'm in a storm when Jesus is asleep. He's not asleep. He's in control. He is sovereign. And this is a picture of the fact that he will take us to the new creation. This is a tiny cameo of the control that Jesus has over the creation. And one day we'll be in the new creation. Some of us may be in the most desperate storms, but pastoral care and Christian leadership are able to say to people, we hold on to Romans 8.28. All things work together for my good. What is my good? The glory of God. And verse 29, we conform to the likeness of Christ. Now again, don't ask me how that works in your life at the moment. I've no idea. I'm just saying I'm not allowing what I don't understand to destroy what I do understand. He is sovereign. He will work it out. We will see it. 
Let me tell you a sweet story John Stott used to tell. When John Stott was nine years old, he had a lovely butterfly collection that he'd put together with his father. It was a thing they did together. He'd go to Regent's Park and, and, and get butterflies. His sister Joy, one day when they were in the nursery and had an argument, threw a cushion at him across the nursery. It missed him, hit his butterfly collection that was all behind the glass, and destroyed it. And John Stott was distraught, and his father, Sir Arnold, could not repair it. And he said, so do you know what I started doing? I started bird watching. And that became what held me through my life in terms of a doctrine of creation. He said, I couldn't have turned up abroad with some arsenic and three nets. So he said, I look back and see how God was sovereign at that moment. Now, again, we can all work that out. But at the cross, particularly, the Lord is sovereign. If he's in control on that day, he's in control today. But we have to be able to teach it, the sovereignty of God. His identity, he's sovereign. What does it mean to be godly now? That's all I've got to ask. And one day I'll be in heaven with a new body. But we hold on. Secondly, uh, mission. I've got to get the mission of God. So I've got to know he's, he's sovereign. That's pastorally critical. Mission, I've got to know I'm loved. You see, the mission of Jesus is about the fact that I'm so loved he died for me. Now, how do I keep that in place? Answer, each day, I keep looking at my sin. I grow downwards and then I see God's grace, and then I, 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 and then, I, and then I, I, I feel joy and I want to serve. Um, I use all the time this book, The Valley of Vision. I don't know if you know it, Puritan Prayers. But in order to keep the grace of God aflame in my heart, I find this prayer book has been absolutely wonderful. Let me read you um, one of the prayers that I love so much. The Puritans knew this stuff, you know. This is divine mercies in this book. Let me commend it to you, but let me read it to you. Thou eternal God is surpassing greatness, unspeakable goodness, superabundant grace. I can as soon count the sands of the ocean's lip as number thy favours towards me. I know but a part, but that part exceeds all praise. I thank thee for personal mercies, measure of health, preservation of body, comforts of house and home, sufficiency of food and clothing, continuance of mental powers, my family, their mutual help and support, the delights of domestic harmony and peace, the, feet, the seats now filled that might have been vacant, my country, church, Bible, faith. But oh, how I mourn my sin in gratitude, vileness, the days that add to my guilt, the scenes that witness my offending tongue, all things in heaven, earth, around, within, without, condemn me, the sun which sees my misdeeds, the darkness which is light to thee, the cruel accuser who justly charges me, the good angels who've been provoked to leave me, thy countenance that scans my secret sins, thy righteous law, thy holy word, my sin-soiled conscience, private life and public life, my neighbours, myself, all right dark things against me. I deny them not. Frame no excuse but confess, Father, I've sinned. Yet still I live and fly repenting to thy outstretched arms. Thou wilt not cast me off, for Jesus brings me near. Thou wilt not condemn me, for he died in my stead. Thou wilt not mark my mountains of sin, for he leveled all, and his beauty covers my deformities. Oh God, I bid farewell to sin by clinging to his cross, hiding in his wounds, and sheltering in his side. And I find those prayers keep me thrilled with the gospel. I just, can I just really recommend this to you, the Valley of Vision, Honestly, I've just found it amazing for each day, the grace of God. So then we do a Romans 12:1, in view of God's mercy, offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. Are our eyes open to that? And then thirdly, as we look down, can we, can we look down thirdly, the call? And can you see what's the choice in verse 34? What's the choice in verse 34? That he called the crowd to him along with his disciples. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. What's the choice here? What can you do? What's the two ways of going, verse 34? You, that's right. Well, that's 35, 36, you save your life or lose it. 34 is either you obey or you don't obey. So when it comes to the call of Jesus, there's a choice. Either I take up my cross and follow Jesus or I disobey. Here's faithful leadership. You see, what does it mean to follow him for us all? So have I got who Jesus is? He's God's son. 
Do I know why he died? He died for me, but then will I obey? And of course, there are millions who go, I know who Jesus is, I know why he died, and he gets an hour on Sunday morning. So it was Schaefer who said, a Christian is a man or woman who bows twice, once to God as their creator, but a second time to Jesus as Lord, and so many don't bow a second time. This is the terrible problem we've got, is that, is that so many people don't live it out elsewhere. They make up their own rules, but they come along. But the disciple, take, you know, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. The disciple takes up their cross. Now, why do it? What's the reason to do it? Have a look down, verse 35. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. It's counterintuitive. As you give your life away, you find it. That's why I do it. Verse 36, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? You see, why obey? Because of my soul. You see, here's the issue. If the Jesus who's come to die in verse, have a, have a look down in verse 31. Do you see verse 31? The son of man must suffer many things. Is that son of man who's come to die? Here's the issue. The same son of man in verse 38 you see, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels, who's returning to rule. If that's the case, it's a no-brainer to follow him. Because, of course, he holds my soul in his hands. He's risen from the dead. So those are the great choices on following Jesus. Is he a great man or is he God? Is it a waste or a rescue? Do I obey or disobey? And what we see with the disciples is they're absolutely hopeless at getting obedience. Honestly, honestly, they're like the clowns. They're like the clowns. Let's have a look, turn over, and investigate this issue of the call in Mark's gospel. So here's the call that we come to. What does it mean to be a faithful leader? Well, don't look at the disciples. Let me read Mark 9, verses 30 to 37. They left that place, passed through Galilee. Jesus didn't want anyone to know where they were going because he was teaching his disciples. So what's he teaching them? The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They'll kill him, and after three days he'll rise. They didn't understand what he meant, were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? So it's a continuous verb here. So he keeps asking. What were you arguing about on the road? Question. What were you arguing about on the road? And they're quiet. But they quit quiet because on the way they'd been arguing about who was the greatest. It's amazing, isn't it? So they're in the company of the Son of God, but they're arguing about who was the greatest. Of course, what they're doing is giving vent to their daydreams. They daydream about moving into number 11, uh, uh, 10 Downing Street and, uh, and there. They're daydreaming about status and position. Uh, that, that's what they're doing here. Uh, do you remember Matthew 22 for your notes? The teachers of the law love the place of honor at the banquets and the most important seats in the synagogue. They love to be, the, to be greeted in the marketplace and to have men call them rabbi. Well, they're thinking about that. They're thinking about status. And of course, it's not surprising they're arguing because actually... Do you remember what's just happened before in Mark 9? It was the transfiguration. Jesus took them up a mountain. I love this. And he says, after they've been up the mountain and they've seen Elijah and Moses and seen him in burning white, do you remember that? Peter, James, and John. And he says, don't tell anyone about it. And so Peter, James, and John come back down the mountain and they say, it was absolutely amazing. He just took the three of us up. We're not meant to say anything. Oh, no. No, no, no. We've got to be quiet about that. But it was amazing. No wonder they're having an argument on the road, don't you reckon? I mean, the other, the, the other nine are going, what about me? Why wasn't I up the mountain? Honestly, it's just classic, isn't it? Absolutely classic. So here they are. They've been status-seeking, not service-seeking. And so Jesus responds to them. And have a look at this. And he does so by means of a saying Uh, uh, an enacted parable and another saying. So let's have a look at the saying. How does he respond? Again, we're on faithful leading. Verse 35, sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and he said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. Now, do you remember 
the theme of Mark's gospel is how low. It's being the servant. He'd gone from being a deserter to a servant. So it was incredibly important to him. And this verse, verse 35, reverses all our expectation of greatness. If you want to be first, you must be the last. And how does he explain that? He says, by being the servant of all. It was interesting, Bill Hybels has been disgraced now as a pastor, and it's been very sad to see. But um, he wrote a book called Descending into Greatness about Christian service, and he said it was my best book and no one ever bought it. <laughs> People didn't want to buy it, a book on service. And here's a question, who's the greatest figure of the 20th century? Who do we think was the greatest figure? I don't know, you might go for Mandela or Churchill or Einstein. But as we think of who's the greatest figure of the century, we tend to be programmed to think of position, status, achievement. And we think greatness equals success. But the epitaph that as a Christian leader, I'm to long for on my grave is this. Can you see? There it is in verse 35, the servant of all. I remember going with Richard Bues, who was my previous boss at All Souls, to Amsterdam 2000. They'd never be able to do it now, post 9, 11, have all those people fly into one country post-COVID. 200 Christian, 200 countries represented, 10,000 leaders, there we were. And my boss, Richard Bues, was given the final address. Billy Graham was ill, so Richard was told to take the communion service and to give the final address. And he was given 12 minutes, and there was a band and, and a choir, and they were given eight minutes, and they took 20 so his talk was, was taken out. Now, I'd watched him spend four months absolutely memorizing that talk. He'd written a commentary on Revelation, and he was going to give that send-off talk to those people. I mean, a highlight of, of his whole ministry being asked to do that. And then the talk just got taken out because everyone had to go because there were planes to catch. So they said, you can give a one-minute verse. And I, I saw this happening. And afterwards, I walked around behind to see him. He was my boss just to to sort of console him, and he was sitting there having a cup of tea, and I said, Richard, that was outrageous. Your talk just got taken out by the, by the choir, by the band. And he looked at me and said, oh, no, 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 Rico, we're servants, we're servants, we just do what we're asked. Now, if it had been me, I'd have been jumping up and down saying, why wasn't the word of God preached? But really, I'd have said, what about my platform? And, you know, I would have walked under a bus for Richard, and it was that humility. Oh, no, Rico, we're servants. No, 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 just dismissed it, getting on with serving. We are to be the servants of all. It was very, very striking. And I remember coming out, and honestly, I just was so rebuked by it. Now, the trouble is, is that today, please jot this down, we ask ourselves questions repeatedly, which tend to, tend to cause us to not be servants. And the questions we ask, and they're so bad, they're so dangerous to these questions, Am I happy? Am I fulfilled? Whilst actually, the Bible says, will you keep asking, am I serving? And it's counterintuitive. As you give your life away, you'll find it. Just keep asking, am I serving? But everyone's asking, am I happy? Am I fulfilled? John Stott wrote this. It's wonderfully liberating experience when the desire to please God overtakes the desire to please ourselves and when love for others displaces love for self. True freedom is not freedom from responsibility to God and others in order to live for myself, but freedom from myself in order to live for God and others. That's so key to Christian leadership, self-forgetfulness. Freedom from myself, my own sin, in order to live for God and others. There's the liberty. Oh, brothers and sisters, I wish I was there. I'm so far from it, but I know it's the right direction. And we've got to stop asking, am I happy? Am I fulfilled? What about me? And be self-forgetful. And of course, it's interesting. What does he then do? The toddler comes in, verse 36. Do you see as we look down? He took a child, had him stand among them, taking him in his arms. He said, whoever welcomes one of these children in my name welcomes me. So he says, listen, and if you want to understand this, don't start thinking about the cabinet, but go and get on your knees in the creche. He says, go to the crash. What about the children? In a culture when children weren't honored. And of course, the previous passage here, the, one, the, one, the next passage we're going to get if we go over the page, 
just to Mark chapter 10, is about the disciples sending away children. So they've still not got it. Mark 10, 13 to 16, and Jesus has to go again. But, but who am I not serving? So will it be children? Will it be the elderly? Will it be people of a certain race? Who's not in your file of facts in terms of addresses and names? What constituency? So often it is the elderly, I think, but I've got to be serving. And then as we come on, because the disciples are still so blind, Jesus teaches the lesson again. Have a look at Mark chapter 10 that we had read for us. And can you please see in this passage, there is a choice to be made. There's no harmonization between, if we look down, verse 35, James and John, the sons of Zedri, came to Jesus and said, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. So that's one way of living. You serve me, and the other is verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to give his life as a ransom for many. So again, in terms of Christian leadership, there are two value systems, two lifestyles we have to to choose. There's one way of living, James and John, do it for us. The other, Jesus, a ransom for many. Self-seeking, as you see there at the bottom, or self-sacrifice. And again, they might call Jesus teacher, but they're not listening to his teaching, are they? He's just spoken in verses 32 to 34 of going to Jerusalem to die. And, and, you know, they've not got it. They've absolutely not got it. I mean, their daydreams are, have a look down. Do you see what they say? We want you to do for us what we ask. What do you want us to do for you? They replied, let one of us sit at your left and the other on your right in glory. What do you think they were planning on sitting on? Perhaps thrones? No, 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 or or cushions. No, they wanted a throne each. They didn't say, oh, Jesus, we want a cushion either side. We want a throne from which we can rule, and then this will all be worth it. Can anyone tell me in Matthew's gospel who makes this request for James and John? Who does it? Their mother. Did you have a mum like that? wants her boy to do well. Their mother says, I want a couple of thrones for my boys, please, Jesus. You know, just it's ridiculous, isn't it? You know, the idols. And this is about idolatry. Everyone, what stops us serving and what stops us doing evangelism is is not understanding our daydreams and nightmares, our blind spots. Now, wonderfully, James was then the first to die. Do you remember that? Acts 12, executed. John was the last to die as a prisoner on Patmos. They did learn service, but at this point, they are blinded by their idols. We want a throne either side of you. We've got to see our blind spots and our idols. So that's the first thing. They're go-getters, they're, sta- they're, they're service, uh, status seekers. They, 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 they want thrones. And so often in Christian leadership, this is the issue, brothers and sisters, We will give our time, energy, money, emotion to those things that we think will serve us. And we've just got to be so careful. You know, John Stott, when when people queued up at All Souls, and sometimes there'd be an hour's worth of people waiting to meet him at the end of a service. They'd waited maybe 20 years. They'd come to All Souls. They'd be waiting to meet him. And he'd say to himself, exhausted, having preached age 78, John... This is someone for whom Christ has died. Now serve them. And of course, the way you serve so often, as we look here, is by, please write this down, listening. Brothers and sisters, it's listening. You see, James and John have just had a study day by Jesus on his death, and they go, we want you to do whatever we ask. So the person who's self-seeking doesn't give time to listen. Oh, We've got, to be, we've got to be listeners. You know, they say, we want you to do whatever he asks. He's just done a study day in his own death. But it's their agenda. And the way we show we trample others is by not listening. Whilst Jesus, he gave his life away. Do you remember Philippians 2? He made himself nothing. He humbled himself. He chose humanity. He chose the cross. He chose to pay our ransom. He chose to go to Jerusalem. He chose our interests. He he humbled himself. He was obsessed with the welfare of others and the glory of God. He never thought about himself. He humbled himself to serve. 
He risked his reputation. He mixed with dropouts, lepers, swindlers, and prostitutes. And therefore, he leaves us with a choice. Self-seeking, honor, glory, prestige, or self-sacrifice in his footsteps. And every day, the Christian has to choose, particularly the leader. We have to choose. Self-seeking or self-sacrifice. And then as we go on, power or service. Again, they've chosen power because they will not listen. We want you to do whatever we ask. It's this refusal to listen. Uh, this is the um, Christianity Explored material here. Um, really, I, I, you know, I've spent 25 years developing it. And when it first came out in 2003, a very senior Christian leader, very senior, wrote to me, and he said, we don't need the material. He said, we've all got to get behind Alpha. And actually, Alpha's been great. Don't get me wrong. I thank God for what Alpha have done. I really do. But nevertheless, this was going through who Jesus is, why he came, what it means to follow him in Mark's gospel. And, uh, and so it was very upsetting to get this letter saying, I don't think you should publish it. Just leave it. We should focus on Alpha. And then I heard that he hadn't even read the material. So he wrote me this letter that was incredibly discouraging to get as a, as a 32-year-old, because I really respected him, and then I heard he'd not even read through it. That was devastating. That was devastating. We've got to be listeners, particularly if you, you know, it was just extraordinary to experience that. And have a look down. Can we see verses 41, 42, they're 43? They're so striking. When the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus, because I think probably because they thought, why didn't I get my request in first? I should have asked for a throne. <laughs> Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, their high officials exercise authority over them. And then four words that are critical to Christian leadership. Please underline them in red in your diary, John Stott used to say. Can you see the four words? Not so with you. So Jesus introduces a new form of leadership. It's not by power and coercion where the leaders are at the top and they boss everyone around below. Christian leadership, the leader is underneath with the towel of the servant washing the disciples' feet. And if you go to a church and the leaders are not like that, leave leave. This is absolutely central to Christian leadership. Just leave. I mean, what are you doing there if the leaders aren't serving? I think in this country, most of the leaders are pretty amazing. But I tell you, what, I've been abroad. I, I was teaching this in Mexico once, where there is a strand of leadership there, not, not the, all the, of course, the Mexican church leaders, but there are, there are a strand of leaders that are sort of Christian princes. They boss everyone. Massive cars, houses. I mean, it's just incredible how they feed off the sheep. And I was teaching this, and an old man who'd obviously been abused much in terms of these leaders uh, stood up as I was preaching, and he shouted, why don't you say this to the leaders here? And I was like, well, don't even really speak Spanish, you know. But I mean, I mean it was so depressing. When we do Christian Explored, we say, find a church where the leaders are like this. Not so with you. It's non-negotiable. If the leaders aren't servant-hearted, go. Find a church where they are servant-hearted. And if you're a leader here today, brothers and sisters, this is non-negotiable. And as I say this, I've got a massive ego problem. Would you pray for me that I'll do it? Pray for me that I'll be servant-hearted and listening and bothering. Just absolutely massive. It is the way of Jesus. There's no harmonization, self-seeking or self-sacrifice. Yakinos is the word here, which means the, a slave, a slave of others. And yet we spend our whole time asking, am I happy and am I fulfilled? Lord, have mercy upon us. Real nobility is the nobility of the servant. J.C. Ryle wrote of this, the greatest clergyman in the church is he who is most conformed to the example of Christ by humility, love, and a continued attendance on his flock, and one who looks on himself as a servant of the children of God. Well, let's close. The last, of course, is security or suffering. You see, James and John didn't just want thrones. 
uh, uh, they, 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 wanted, they wanted security. And Jesus says, verse 38, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? And they're on a roll by now and they go, of course we can. Of course. Because they're thinking of the banquets that the Herods enjoyed. But of course, this cup was the cup of Gethsemane, the cup of suffering. And Jesus drank it as he died for us. And in time, as their eyes were opened, John drank it on Patmos as an old man, and James drank it as he was executed. But my goodness me, it took them some time. And both were called to suffer. They couldn't enjoy a quiet life surrounded by possessions and position. They couldn't do that. And John Stodd has written of this passage, where are the Christians who are prepared to put service before security? I tell you, there are thousands of pioneer tasks in the third world and in the inner cities waiting to be done, which challenge our middle-class conventionality and call for vision, courage, and endurance and commitment. Very interesting. I was told by a church warden at St. Nick's Seven Oaks. Seven Oaks is probably the wealthiest parish in Britain, that there were 85 evangelicals that applied for the job there. Isn't it amazing that God was calling 85 people to St. Nick's Seven Oaks? And yet I've got another friend, Henry Corbett, in the inner city of Liverpool, and he tells me that there are no applications for jobs there. It's very striking, isn't it? So you see, Jesus did not stay in the safety zone. He didn't, he didn't stay in heaven. He made himself vulnerable. He suffered pain, rejection, and death. And he embraced suffering, not security, and we have to choose. And here, James and John... While they coveted honour, Jesus was exposed to shame and humiliation. They were hungry for power. Jesus relinquished it to serve. They demanded comfort and security. Jesus came to suffer and die. On the one hand, honour, power, security. On the other, sacrifice, service and suffering. And I only have four words for you that summarise this whole session. And they are, of course, not so with you. Not so with you. Those are the words of Jesus on this. That's all you have to take away from today. Not so with you, wherever you are. Perhaps you're very powerful and there are many people working for you. What does it mean to serve them? Perhaps you're a young man or woman and you've got a lifetime ahead of you. What does it mean to sacrifice your life in service? Perhaps you're just going back to your local church and you're going back on the rotors and you're going to serve and we just do it for Jesus. But the model of Jesus is amazing. It won't be easy to share his cup and baptism, but he says that we are not to be served, but to serve and give our, our lives as a ransom for many. And the key is this. The symbol of Jesus' followers was not a throne. It was a cross. It wasn't a throne. It was a cross. Okay, let's just have a moment there just to stop and to pray about our own situation. Let's have a moment, and then we'll conclude with one little exercise. What strikes you most from this? Where do you need to serve, brother and sister? Oh, Father God, we, we pray that you would help us to adopt the way of Jesus and not the way of James and John, to get down off the throne and up onto the cross. Are we willing? We must choose. Self-seeking or self-sacrifice, power or service, security or suffering. Lord Jesus, thank you that we're forgiven for our self-centeredness. Thank you so much that you died, that we're cleansed afresh and that you send your spirit to spur us to offer our lives in sacrifice. Please, Lord, help us to go forward, we pray. Amen. And we've got one minute, so I just want to show you a great little exercise to take away. Here it is, just as you close. What happens if I understand identity and mission but not call? So if you turn to your notes, what happens if you, do you see on the slide there? If you cross out, call. So I know who Jesus is. I know what it means to follow him, but I don't teach. Take up your cross and follow him. What happens? What's the result? Pastorally for Christian and non-Christian. Now, I've got to tell you this. 
when I came to Keswick about 20 years ago, I was doing a seminar, and I put this diagram up, and at the end, an evangelist came up to me in floods of tears. The person was about 50, and they said to me, I now see why there's been so little fruit from my ministry. I've been teaching identity mission, but have left call as a discipleship issue, not an evangelism issue. But it's evangelism. Take up your cross and follow me. There's only one way in. I've got to teach Mark 9 and 10 to the non-Christian too. Secondly, gosh, do you know, it was, an, it was haunting that moment, haunting. This person said, I've taught the wrong gospel. Secondly, what happens if I've got identity and call but not mission? What happens if I've, I, I, I come from a Christian home and, and, and I'm so discouraged because my parents are Christian, my brothers and sisters, but I'm not, and I, I just say, I just can't be like them. What do I do with my sin? What, is, what happens if I know who he is, I know what it means to follow him, but I've not understood the cross, I've not got the valley of vision in place? And then lastly, what happens if I've got mission and call but not identity, if I don't understand God is sovereign? You see, in my leadership, I've got to get he's sovereign. In my leadership, I've got to get grace. In the leadership, I've got to get perseverance. Often the call is about persevering, keeping going. But can I send you off just to do that exercise? What happens if I miss each one out so that we're teaching the whole gospel and living by it too? And which one of those three? Sovereignty, that's identity. Mission, that's grace. And perseverance, that call. Have you in your leadership been forgetting? Which one have you been forgetting? We've got to do all three. God bless. Well, it's a challenge, isn't it, to be on mission? But it's so encouraging to hear Rico speak, and I certainly have been challenged. And I, we use Christianity Explored in our church, and it, it is a great resource. If you haven't used it, do get a copy and go through it. It's such a simple way to explain the gospel to people who are in your local community. So thank you to Rico for equipping the church in how we can do mission in our local communities. And thank you to you all for coming along this morning. Uh, we've got our Bible reading coming up soon, so please do stick around for that as we listen to Tim Chester. And then we've got our evening celebration too. So thank you for coming and we'll see you later. i 
such depths of sorrow borne for me. Your cross, O oh Lord, taught me to love, for there I tasted love divine. It fills my heart with power enough to make your costly service mine. No sin too great to meet with grace, no enemy too foul to bless. Your love in wounds of sacrifice, teach me, O oh Lord, to love like this. Your cross, O oh Lord, taught me to sing, for now. Seeing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh, high, marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love. A sinner condemned on me, saying, How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, how wonderful is my sin.
Oh, Lord, taught me to read. 